This is episode 363 of the Beyond the Food Show. And today we're going to talk about why you perhaps are struggling with intuitive eating. Likely, not what you think. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Going to Beyond the Food Show, the only podcast that teaches you how to reshape your mind, not your body, to make your life better, bigger, and bolder, your undieted life. I'm your host, Stephanie Dodier, reform dieter, nutritionist, and coach. You ready? Let's do this. Welcome back to the podcast. I have a greatest hits episode for you today. It's a podcast I recorded nearly three years ago, where I went through five of the most frequent reasons I encounter as to why women are quote, struggling, end quote, with intuitive eating. Because I don't believe that intuitive eating is a pass or fail kind of journey we put ourselves through, even though for many of us, that's how we go into intuitive eating, because that's all we've known. All we've known is, quote unquote, dieting, get it right, get it wrong, when it comes to food. And part of the journey of intuitive eating is not engaging with eating as a pass or fail. So that's probably the number one reason why women are challenged when they come to intuitive eating is exactly that, is the mindset, is the thoughts and the belief we carry with us when we begin our journey with intuitive eating. I hope this episode serves you well. And if you are on your journey of intuitive eating, that you're challenged or not, that you're struggling or not, I think this is going to be a very valuable 30 minutes for you. Enjoy. So on to this week's topic, which is a link with the Academy. We're going to talk about why intuitive eating may not be working for you, or at least that's what you think, that intuitive eating is not working for you. And honestly, the answer is within the academy, because very often when we're struggling with intuitive eating is because the issue was never food. So we can spend years focusing on food when the issue is beyond the food. Yeah, pun intended. (laughs) So if you're struggling with intuitive eating and you've read the book and you perhaps even done the workbook and you're struggling, it's likely because the issue was never the food in the first place of something else, either the mindset, either your emotion, your ability to be present, body image. Therefore, and that's why I'm saying that the answer is in the academy. But what I'm going to try to do today is give you some pointers for all of you who perhaps may not join the academy, but still struggle with emotional eating. So the first thing, if you take one thing away, or if you stop listening to the podcast, here's what I want you to know. You can't fail at intuitive eating. Now, did you get it? You cannot fail at intuitive eating. So you may not think that it's not working, It's likely because of reason number five, which is you're misunderstanding intuitive eating. You're thinking or approaching intuitive eating like a diet, a fail or success system. You're not fully understanding and sitting into the fact that intuitive eating is the entire relationship to food from how you think about food, even before eating, to the moment where you eat, to the after experience of eating and how you process eating. Intuitive eating is this whole thing. So perhaps you're only fixated on the eating cues, right? Hunger, fullness, and satisfaction, and not really deep diving in the before and after eating experience. To heal your relationship to food, you have to heal the entire eating experience, which leads me to then 
top reason number four as to why intuitive eating doesn't work for you, it's because you're not fully committed. You are holding on some fear or some hesitation as to looking beyond the eating experience, right? When we take someone through the intuitive eating process, one of the things that comes out really quickly is the fact that we need to dig deep. And many times when that digging deep becomes obvious, that's when people back out. They're like, ooh, don't want to look there. I don't want to look at this part of my life. I've been buried in it. I don't want to. It's like tucked away in a corner of my body, and I don't want to go there. So that then takes me to reason number three. We are engaging in intuitive eating like a diet. We are only focusing on food with a checklist of the 10 principle and we're memorizing the 10 principle and then we're expecting it to work like a math formula. Where in fact, intuitive eating is digging deep, looking at the reason why we've engaged with food and our body in a certain way and doing this whole unearthing of how we engage with our whole self. Because the way we relate to food is the way we relate to our whole being of ourselves, of how we even engage into the world. It's also a direct reflection of how we engage with food. Now on to reason number two that I see the most often as to why people struggle with intuitive eating. They are not willing to put weight loss goal on the back burner. Now, here's a harsh truth for all of us. 90% of the reason why we go on a first diet and we start the journey of dieting is because we are unhappy about our body. The root cause of all dieting effort is some discomfort or dissatisfaction about the body. So the real, 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 real way of healing our relationship to food is by first healing our relationship to our body. So when I run program with intuitive eating on our work with someone one-on-one, the first thing I get out of the way is, are you willing to put your weight loss goal on the back burner? Because if you're not, then our work together is not going to be conclusive. It's not going to work because you are going to sabotage all your decision around food because you are still hoping to lose weight, maintain a weight loss, or change something about your body. The number one reason why I've experienced women that says that intuitive eating is not working for them is because they have fear. They're making choices around intuitive eating or body image from a place of fear, not love. That is the number one reason is we engage with our body, we engage with food, we engage with life from a place of fear, not love. Love is the only way to heal anything in our life. Love is the only way to make permanent changes in our life of any kind. So when we make decision to go, for an example, on and learn intuitive eating from a place of fear because we think, you know, I've tried every diet in this world. Clearly diet doesn't work, but I need to lose weight. So let me try intuitive eating, still being afraid of not losing weight or maintaining a weight loss from that place of fear around body image. Then again, it leads you to sabotage your journey of intuitive eating. So Make choices from a place of love. Now, in your journey of learning intuitive eating, here's four pillars 
that need to be present in your journey in order for intuitive eating to, quote, work for you. You must accept and see that your body has a wisdom in itself, that you have, just like all other human beings, eating cues, hunger, fullness, and satisfaction, and those cues aren't broken. There's nothing broken about you or about your eating cue. You have that wisdom within you. Your body knows what's good for you, even if it meant being in a large body, gaining weight, not losing weight, your body is wise and it's doing that for a reason. The second pillar is body trust. You need to trust that wisdom. And then the third pillar is body respect. You need to respect your body, its wisdom, and you need to trust it. These are like working together. So you may not have this trust right now. You may not have this respect for your body. But you need to develop that trust and that respect through your journey of intuitive eating. And then the last piece, the last pillar is body neutrality. Switching from judgment to curiosity. Being curious about why you're behaving a certain way instead of judging those behavior. Being curious about what it means for you to trust your body, to respect your body. Being curious about this wisdom and letting yourself be guided by this wisdom inside of all of us. So what I thought I would do for the rest of the podcast is actually answer 10 case study. I went on my Instagram account and I posted a question a couple days ago around why do you struggle with intuitive eating? Why is it not working for you? And I have picked 10 answer from that question. And I'm going to quickly answer them. So to the ladies who provided some material for me, here we go. Number one, I am not eating enough. Good point. Why is that? Why is it that you're not eating enough and that is leading you to intuitive eating not working? What's behind that? Likely, it has to do with fat phobia. It has to do with a fear around gaining weight or not maintaining a weight loss or changing something around your body or even perhaps healthier is always in a tenor body, some type of belief. So ask yourself, why is it that you're not eating enough food? Case study number two, I have an eating disorder, anorexia for say, and that's why intuitive eating doesn't work for me. Well, here's what I want to say to you. If you have a diagnosed eating disorder, You need to work one-on-one with an expert, particularly the expert or the healthcare professional that has diagnosed you. When you have an eating disorder and you work one-on-one with someone, you will not start with intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is not the starting point of a treatment of eating disorder. It is along the way, once we've given you tools to address the trauma, then we can begin intuitive eating. So go get support 101 if you are diagnosed with an eating disorder. Do not try to treat yourself with intuitive eating. Case study number three. I would eat chips and pasta nonstop. That's why intuitive eating doesn't work for me. So one question for you. So what? What would happen if you ate just chips and pasta nonstop? What's behind that? What's the fear behind this statement? Likely, it has something to do with weight again but I'll gain weight, but I'll have a gluten attack, but I'll have diabetes. I'll catch diabetes. I get that a lot. Like I'll catch diabetes because my, my blood sugar will go up. Can you see that all of that is fear? You are afraid of what's sitting behind chips and pasta. 
So here's a quick tip for all of you. Something that we teach within the self-coaching model, which is start asking yourself powerful question. Don't let yourself be stuck in that state of fear, but ask yourself bigger questions. So my favorite one is, so what? So what would happen if blah, 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 blah. Try to understand yourself. What's going on in your head? Here's another example of powerful question. What are you making that mean? So for example, when people say I'm afraid of gaining weight, my comeback is, so what are you making that mean about yourself? And then you have to reflect on that journal and start outlining all your core beliefs. What are you thinking about this thing, this X situation, right? So for an example, what are you thinking about being fat? What are your thoughts around that? What's going on in the background in your mind that creates that fear of gaining weight? When people say, well, I feel like a failure, I'll say, so why do you feel this way? What has happened for you to feel this way? What action do you take when you feel that way? Do you create your own self-sabotage environment? These are powerful questions to ask yourself. Now, one of the fundamental of intuitive eating for all of you who are afraid of eating all the chips and the pasta is the pendulum effect. When we give ourselves unconditional permission to eat, our eating will swing. Like we've been holding back and restricting and restricting. And then when we finally release the rules, we're going to go and overeat. That's for sure. We're going to eat all the things that were forbidden. That's a basic human reaction. But the pendulum will stop swinging with the unconditional permission to eat, right? And you starting to eat all the pastas and the chips. At some point, you're going to get sick of all the pasta and the chips. And then the pendulum's going to start swinging less and less and less until it actually settle in the middle into the space of intuitive eating and mindful eating. So what you are afraid of must happen. However, fearing it is what you need to work through. Case study number four, I feel like I don't trust myself. That's why intuitive eating doesn't work. Yep, you don't. You don't trust yourself. I didn't trust myself. All of my students don't trust themselves. That is the tenet of diet culture. The reason why diet culture is so prevalent and it's so strong, it's because it robs us of our autonomy, of our ability to trust ourselves. And it makes us dependent on those diet gurus, those wellness gurus. The assertion of our own autonomy as human is essential. I just taught that in our workshop, Women, Food, and Power, which by the way, I'm going to repeat likely in February again. But as human, we have three psychological need to achieve, quote, happiness. It is autonomy, competence, and relatedness. This ability to fulfill our own needs, this space when we can trust ourselves that we can fulfill our need, that we are competent and we are able to fulfill our needs, and that through this competence, we can relate to our environment, to our community, to our tribe. Dieting takes all of that away. Dieting says, you don't know how to eat, you're fat. You can be part of the cool kids in the community because of the size of your body. So we're going to take all your autonomy around food away and we're going to control it all for you. That's what diet culture says. So it robs us from our basic needs as human. So yes, sister, you don't trust yourself. You have to rebuild your relationship to yourself to trust yourself. And that begins with a self-compassionate mindset, accepting that that 
what happens to you, that you were caught up into the diet cycle, you were affected and impacted by diet culture, this is where you are today, and now you need to go on the healing journey of rebuilding that relationship of trust and respect towards your body wisdom. Next case study. Intuitive eating doesn't work for me because I can't separate craving from a genuine need from my body. Here's something very strong for you. What if every craving that comes out of your body is genuine? Even what you qualify as your emotional craving. What we have to understand is that whatever comes out out of our body, whatever is expressed from this wisdom is a need of some format. We may not be craving the thing that's going to fulfill our need, but our body is telling us we need X, Y, Z. We need, we need, we need something. I want you to start seeing your emotional craving has a gift. What is hiding behind it? Ask powerful question. What do I need now? When you crave and you're not physically hungry, what do I need? What am I feeling right now? That's what we teach when we teach intuitive eating, right? What am I feeling? What do I need? Ask yourself those two questions consistently. Now, one of the base principles that is missing likely in your education here is that our emotion as human are the radar to guide our life. The way we feel is the guiding, shining light to make decision in our life. When we feel good, when we feel good internally, we want more. We should want more of this thing that makes us feel good. And the thing that doesn't make us feel good, that create anxiety, that create fear, We shouldn't invite more in our life. So let's reframe our emotion. This is emotional intelligence. Let's reframe our emotion as a radar, as a scanner to make decision in our life. The next one, the next case study is intuitive eating doesn't work for me because I don't know where to start. Well, hello, you. You're new to intuitive eating. We've got a ton of resources for you. Here's what I want you to do. If you're new here, start at podcast 199 and move your way up. We've addressed a lot of intuitive eating, beginner's question, podcast 199 up to the recent one here. The other thing, you can go grab the intuitive eating guide on my website, stephaniedoze.com slash start, and then grab the guide, and then you're going to have over 30 emails sent to you every three days, educating you on all the basic of intuitive eating, body image, diet culture, emotional intelligence, mindset, all that stuff. Every three days, I'm going to be popping in with a free email to get you educated. So if you're new, get some education. If you're like, I got some education, but I don't know where to start, go get a structure, right? You can grab Intuitive Eating Workbook from my mentor, Evelyn Triboli, and she's going to walk you through the 10 principle with exercise and a logical approach. You can get the Intuitive Eating Project, which is my program where I coach you through a structured approach to intuitive eating, or you can join us in the academy. (laughs) Case study number five. Knowing I have true allergy to certain food, but feeling triggered and restricted by not eating them. So this is a dicey one. Um, Let's define true allergy first. True allergy are tested and diagnosed by a medical expert, very often a specialist, an allergy specialist. And it's likely because you've had several severe reaction to, in our case, the food. And typically, those severe reactions include a lot of pain. So in the cases that I've worked with people who've had diagnosed allergy, for an example, seafood allergy or 
even celiac disease, which is, which is some kind of allergy to the gluten molecule, they don't want to eat the food that caused them so much pain because they do not want more pain in their life and they do, do not have a desire to die, right? So I want you to think about why you're desiring to cause yourself such severe pain and even threatening your life. Like this is a big, profound question that you need to unpack. You need to unpack the story behind that, the thoughts behind that, right? This whole mindset piece behind this and the whole relationship to your body of trust and respect of neutrality. Now, very often when I start with that, people will say, well, it's not really an allergy that I have. It's an intolerance. Ah, big difference. So here's what I want you to know. Food and tolerance currently do not have a recognized mechanism of diagnosis because intolerance vary greatly from moment to moment to emotional state to physical state and they change throughout your life. So what you are intolerant to today may not even be the same thing tomorrow or in a month from now. So at this point in time, there's no valid mechanism of diagnosed food intolerance because of that. I have a friend who is a nutritionist and she works in the field of autoimmune condition and she has tested via her patients every single food intolerance on the market in the U.S. right now. And every one of them has come back with different diagnoses. Every one of them. So she stopped referring people out to food intolerance because it doesn't work. So to that, know that if it's a food intolerance, it could change greatly, right? And again, there is a principle inside of intuitive eating that talks about gentle nutrition and health, but it is the last one. What we first need to do is to give ourselves unconditional permission to eat first and Understand what are our beliefs behind food. So in the case of intolerance or allergy, and you know you're not going to feel good after, ask yourself, why is it that I want to cause myself pain? Start with that question. The next case study, overeating things that aren't filling, parenthesis, nutritious, because I'm still at a place of binging. And that's why intuitive eating doesn't work for me there's a lot in that question. Here's where I go first as an expert in this field, the parenthesis, nutritious. So for you and many women, there is still deep core beliefs about good and bad food. If that's you, go back to podcast 199. And know that is a learned skill, a learned behavior, a learned side effect of dieting, of labeling food as good or bad, which leads you to believe that you should make, quote, nutritious choices by eating these food. And that space of binging is only caused by the restriction you put in the first place on the, quote, bad food. So here's what I would invite you to do. Approach the binging, quote, in a space of curiosity, why am I binging on, quote, these foods? Why do I believe that I need to eat nutritious food over other food? Remove completely the judgment and approach that with curiosity, with self-compassion, and try to understand what goes on in your mind. And that will be the solution for you. And expect the pendulum, as I explained earlier. The next one. What to eat, interrogation mark. I was raised on a microwave food diet. So only eat with cues is impossible for me because I don't know what to eat. And that's why intuitive eating doesn't work for me. So let me ask you this. Did you go to the grocery store, stood in the grocery store, in the first department where you enter, which is typically, I don't know, fruit and vegetables and dairy, and ask yourself, what do I want to eat? what do I want to try? Right? Another thing that I highly recommend to people is 
80% of the food when you begin your intuitive eating journey is perhaps recipes you've had in the past. And 20% is new stuff. Go out to the grocery store and buy one fruit, one vegetables, one dairy product you've never tried before. Put it in your cart, purchase it, go on Mr. Google, try to find a way of cook it, prepare it, and then have it in the intuitive eating format of eating, which is very mindfully. Ask yourself, do I like it? Does it make me feel pleasurable? Does it make me feel satisfied? Am I full? Do I enjoy it? And then either keep it on your repertoire or discard it. Do the same thing with the recipes. If you have a family and you're feeding people, put 80% of your recipe on repeat and every week bring in a new recipe, a brand new one. Now, this is where the whole discussion about cookbook comes in. And this is a real challenge to find cookbook that are not diet culture embedded or wellness diet embedded. I get it. So here's two cookbook that I tend to recommend. Number one is the Pescatarian Cookbook from registered dietitian Kara Hard Street. And I have a real problem saying her name. Hard Street, H-A-R-D-B-S-T-R-E-E-T. She's an intuitive eating dietitian who wrote a cookbook. The other one is a cookbook called Enjoying Food Peace, Intuitive Eating Cookbook. It's on Amazon. It's only a digital version. So this is a call out to all of you foodies out there and perhaps even food blogger. There is a need for intuitive eating cookbook. But in the meantime, go literally stand in the middle of the grocery store and ask yourself, what is it do I want to eat? 80% buy the things that you know you like, and 20% introduce something new in each food category and see what happens. The next one, being able to figure out what I want to eat. I'm still always trying to make healthy choices. And that's why intuitive eating doesn't work for me. So there's a missing step in your process there somewhere, which is principle number one, unconditional permission to eat. And I know this is a hard one, but I would recommend that you go back and really investigate your core beliefs around, quote, healthy and unhealthy food. Because it sounds like to me, There is still some mind stuff going on, some thoughts and some emotions and some core beliefs around food being healthy and unhealthy and you needing to be healthy. There are perhaps even some fat phobia and some fear of gaining weight if you're not healthy or the fear of catching diabetes, that kind of old core belief that's holding you back. And definitely there's some fear behind this one. Second to last one. Seeing diet info and before and after picture on my Instagram feed. Girl, I get it. And we are in January right now. I did this poll in January. So this is the heaviest month of diet culture. And it's going to shake you to your core if you're still hesitant. So for all of you that are still like hanging over the fence, if you are not empowering yourself to clean up your social media feed, chances are you're going to get sucked back into diet culture. The marketing machine behind diet culture, ladies, is unbelievably powerful. So do me a favor, sister, empower the heck out of yourself and unfollow, 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 (laughs) unfollow. Even if it is on Facebook and if it is family member, you don't need to unfriend them. You need to unfollow them. They will not know that you've unfollowed them. This is only you. They will still appear to be your friend. They will be able to see your content or your post, but you will not see theirs. See what I'm saying? Like that's a huge trick. But What's sitting behind that at the core here is an empowerment belief. 
There is this belief that you are not empowered to make the right choices for you and to just say no. Very interestingly, I did a poll on my Instagram story a week ago, and I asked the women on my feed, when I make content around feminism, how do you like it? And 40% of the women on my feed said that they were afraid of me and my content around feminism. They were afraid of feminism. So in feminism, all it is, is the empowerment of women and female to stand for what is right for us. So there's some core beliefs, again, around that for you, but definitely know that you are empowered to make the decision and to follow who you want and who you want on your feed. But really reflect about what it means to be an empowered female or woman for you. And then the last one, I get this at least two to three times a week. So I'm going to do it for all of you here one more time. The reason why intuitive eating doesn't work for me is because of my sugar addiction and I cannot get over it. So it's never going to work for me. So we go. Ready for this? There's no such thing as sugar addiction. (laughs) Okay. Let's go to the research. The research around sugar addiction has only been done on the rat model. It's never been experienced on human. That's the first thing. Second thing, when the researcher exposed the rat to sugary water in that case, they only found the addiction behavior when the sugary substance was restricted and then re-exposed, restricted, re-exposed, restricted, re-exposed. Then the rat displayed addictive behavior. So what does that mean? That means that when you restrict sugar or you hold belief around sugar being bad, you are restricting sugar in your head or even physically, you will display addictive behavior. And we know that not only with sugar, but with all the food, you have to give yourself unconditional permission to eat. Otherwise, you will have the restrict binge cycle all the time. So it's not because of sugar. It's because of your attitude towards the substance, in this case, sugar, or it could be chips, it could be chocolate. So there's a lot of core beliefs around this. There's a lot of mindset works that needs to be done around this. There's perhaps even a lot of research to prove to yourself as to why sugar is not addictive. There's a great piece of content on my website. If you go to my website and in the search box where there's the little lens there, you put in sugar addiction, you will find an actual video that I did with a quote sugar addiction specialist who did a complete assessment on me. And I did it on camera with her and all of you who were watching at the time. So it's all film a ton of question we went through. And then guess what? The going to be on the food method proved there was no addiction in me to sugar. There was behavior in my past that demonstrated an addictive behavior to sugar. But with the work that I've done, the going to be on the food method, I am now sitting in this place where there's absolutely no trace left of quote addiction to sugar in me. And she will say, when you watch the video, she's never seen that before. For sure, she's never studied intuitive eater, so she's never seen that before. But the proof is in the pudding. When you release the rules around food, the addictive behavior goes away. So there you go, ladies. This is my advice to you combined with real life situation as to why you may be struggling. If you have more, please reach out to me on social media or email us. I would love to help you further. And as always, if this show helped you, please leave us a review. It does a tremendous amount of support to the podcast and help us rank higher, which by the way, now we're consistently because of all of you in the top 20 of the nutrition podcasts. 
Stay tuned for the next podcast. In the meantime, I love you and I look forward to hang out with you on the next episode. If you are loving what you're learning on the podcast, you have to come and check out Undiet Your Life. This is where we get to hang out together, where you get the individual help applying the concept thought on the podcast while learning new coaching tool that will make your life even more amazing. It's also where you get to apply the learning to think better, eat better, and feel better and create your undieted life, your better, bigger, and bolder life. Go to stephaniedoze.com forward slash join. I'd love to have you join us inside of Undiet Your Life, and I'll see you on the other side.